Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be looking at some basic solutions for viscous flow. Now, in general, the equations for fully viscous flow are really complex. But if we have some really simple cases, then we can actually come up with some good solutions for them. So the first case we're going to be looking at is just flow between two flat plates. And for this first case, we're going to say that our top plate is moving with some velocity u, but our bottom plate is held constant. There's no velocity. For ideal flow, we wouldn't actually care about how these plates are moving because it wouldn't have any effect on our flow field. But we have an additional boundary condition once we start talking about friction. And that condition is called the no slip condition. All it says is that if you look at the surface of our plates here, the fluid at that exact point can't slip along the surface. On our motionless plate at the bottom, our velocity, a lowercase u, is going to be equal to zero. On the top, where we say that y is equal to some value, which is the thickness here, uh, we're going to use a as our value. That velocity, the velocity of the flow field here, is going to be equal to the velocity of the plate, u. So let me just fill in some of these details. The distance between these two plates is a. We've defined our axis such that y is equal to zero on the bottom plate. We don't really care where x is at this point. Our goal is to draw a velocity profile of the flow between these two flat plates. So to get to that, let's look at our force balance for this situation. Let's take a little piece of our flow field and then zoom in so that we can come up with some forces from the pressures and the friction on the surfaces. So pressure doesn't change from hydrostatics. We're only going to be looking at the forces in the x direction here, so we only care about the p pushing from the left and the p plus dpdx delta x pushing on the right. But now we also have friction to deal with. Friction is going to cause some shear stress, and shear stress is going to be positive to the right on the top and positive to the left on the bottom. On the bottom, let's say that it has a value tau, and on the top, let's give it a value tau plus d tau by dy times delta y. Then finally, let's give some names to these distances and surfaces so we can go to our force balance equation. The x distance is just going to be delta x, and we'll have delta y, and delta z will be into the page. Then we're going to name this bottom surface surface 1, on the left is surface two, on the top is three, and to the right is four. So with all of that out of the way, we can go ahead and move to our force balance equation. And we're only looking at the sum of the forces in the x direction. So to start off, we have a pressure on the left-hand side, so that's P times A2, minus this other pressure on the right-hand side, P plus dP dx delta x times A3, and it's negative because it's pushing to the left. And then this shear force on the bottom is pushing to the left as well, so we have a negative tau times A1, and then the force on the top is pushing to the right. So this will be plus tau plus d tau dy times delta y, all multiplied by A3. And we're gonna restrict our flow field to be steady. And what that means is that even though we have some velocity, we're not going to have any accelerations within our flow field. So we can set this force balance equal to zero. I just noticed I wrote the wrong area here. This should be A4. Now we get to cancel out terms. A2 is equal to A4, so we can just cancel out those P's. A1 is equal to A3, so we can cancel out the tau's. And what we end up with from all that is a negative dp dx times delta x a4 plus a positive d tau dy multiplied by delta y a3 is equal to zero. Now a4 is equal to delta y times delta z, and a3 is equal to delta x delta z. 
So the end result of all that is we can cancel out all of the deltas from our equation. And we end up with a very simple equation. The change in pressure with respect to x is equal to the change in the shear stress with respect to y. Let's say that the change in pressure for this situation is equal to zero. Now, if that's the case, then that means that tau is going to be a constant. And since tau is equal to mu times du dy, du dy is also going to be a constant. So we can write that u is equal to c1, some unknown constant, multiplied by y, plus another unknown constant, c2. And then all we need to do from here is just write in our boundary conditions that we've defined from our picture. So u of zero is just going to be equal to c2, and we've said that that's equal to zero. u of a now is just going to be equal to c1 times a, and that's equal to this capital U, the velocity of our top plate. And that means that c1 is equal to u divided by a. So our final result here is that our velocity over the entire flow field is equal to this capital U divided by A multiplied by Y. And this is just a straight line. So essentially, our velocity profile is just a straight line connecting these two points. And that's our entire solution for any situation where dp dx is equal to zero. It's just a straight line connecting the velocity of the top plate to the velocity of the bottom plate. Okay, now let's look at the more interesting situation where dp dx is equal to some constant. Now we're going to keep it simple by looking only at the situation of two flat plates that can't move. So both of these are stationary and there's just a pressure that's forcing fluid in between them. But that means that on both our top and bottom surface, we're going to have a velocity of zero. And we said that dp by dx is equal to a constant. We said up above that dp dx is just equal to d tau dy. That means that tau is just going to be equal to this dp dx multiplied by y plus some unknown constant. And we're just going to be carrying around this dp dx as if it were a constant. And once again, this is equal to mu times du dy. So then we can write du dy just by dividing through by mu. And integrating gives us a y squared over 2 here, a y here, and an additional constant. So that's as far as we can get with integration. Let's go look at our boundary conditions. u of 0 is going to get rid of both of our y's here. So we're just going to end up with c2. And so we know that c2 is equal to 0 u of a means that we actually need to plug in a's to both of these y values. So we end up with 1 over 2 mu dp dx times a squared plus this unknown c1 over mu times a. And once again, this is equal to 0. So to solve for c1, we divide through by a, we divide through by this mu, and we end up with c1 is equal to a negative dp dx multiplied by a divided by 2. So writing out the full solution, we end up with u is equal to 1 over 2 mu dp dx multiplied by this y squared here minus a times y. And this is the final solution for our second case. So now let's plug in a value for y. And let's say that this is equal to a over 2, right in the middle of our space here. So a over 2 squared is going to equal to a squared over 4. a times a over 2 is equal to a squared over 2. So u of a over 2 is going to be equal to a negative 1 over 2 mu times dp dx times a squared over 4. So what does this mean for us? Well, in order for our velocity to be moving to the right, we actually need our pressure to be decreasing as we go to the right. 
Now, this makes sense. Our pressure should be pushing our flow along, and our walls should be trying to keep it from moving. So pressure over here is going to be high. Pressure to the right is going to be low. This means that dpdx is negative whenever we're talking about velocity to the right. Our velocity in the center is going to be some value. And this should follow the path of a parabola with a peak right in the middle. So for our second case, where we have some dpdx, the key results are first, that our pressure is decreasing as we move along. And then second, that our flow field is going to be shaped like a parabola.